You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Monday, December 3rd, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Marcy Wheeler, journalist, blogger, author, answering the question, is this Mueller's endgame time? Meanwhile, George Bush Sr.'s death not in vain as it spurs a near two-week extension in budget uh, negotiations amongst the Republicans and Democrats. Very hard to sum up the achievement of one man's life, but that's pretty big. CIA. Michigan and Wisconsin Republicans plot ways of overturning their gubernatorial losses. And more info implicating MBS and Khashoggi's death. Meanwhile, riots continue in France and runoffs with big stakes happening this week. Tomorrow in Georgia, Thursday or Friday in Louisiana. Secretary of State seats are up. Meanwhile, Trump having trade talks and presumably cake with Xi Jinping. A major international climate conference starts in Poland. And will a Democratic House call for a Jeffrey Epstein investigation? Uh, maybe not. Meanwhile, Beck is back. <laughs> Never Trumper no more. The Blaze and CRTV to merge in Good. making one powerhouse. Oh, not with Samantha B in a call for civility and shared humanity. It did that. that really? merger did not take it. For a second, <clears throat> I thought there was a new blood. Beck album. No, no, none of that. Sorry. Beck is now going to be Gavin McGinnis's patron. And lastly, over half of Americans delay or altogether avoid health care because of money. Making America great again. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, lot of news, a lot of news today, and uh, we will try and get to uh, some of it. I imagine by midweek we're going to hear even more news on the Mueller front, uh, but we have almost like a almost a 48-hour lull in, in that information, as far as I can tell. Uh, Donald Trump is in Argentina. We will get to that at the... Um, uh, the G, what is it? The G twenty, G twenty, G twenty, G twenty. Why so many? 20. It's the great twenty. There's Why a lot of twenty. It's the so elite many. Um, so on a day when I guess the CIA is leaking, and I can't quite. Uh, th- this story just continues uh, to confound me a little bit. I mean, one gets the sense that these leaks from the CIA, if they're coming from the CIA, and presumably they are in some fashion, that um, there is this much and and so detailed of information. Maybe it's coming through the Turkish government, but it seems to be maybe uh, through our intelligence services. The level of um, specificity in terms of uh, the information that we have about MPS directing and getting reports from the killers that were sent to uh, chop up a Khashoggi to kill this guy. Uh, it's pretty extraordinary. There does not seem to be 
much consternation in the Bush administration to these leaks, which is odd, right? I mean, this is around when you would start to hear— In the Trump administration. Yeah, in the, excuse me, the Trump administration. You would imagine um, the head of the CIA would be troubled <laughs> by these leaks— if this wasn't in some way a me- mechanism in which to convince Donald Trump to, to do something. What? So I don't know, but, but we'll see. Meanwhile, uh, one of the uh, subjects of those leaks, of course, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, he was at the G20, and... Um, I I don't know how to describe this. I don't know that I've ever seen two world leaders ever shake hands like this. Never mind. I mean, this is called being cool. It's called having a certain camaraderie. There's a handshake between Barack Obama and Kevin Durant that looks a lot like this. Yeah, I guess those are world leaders. What's up, killer? Check this out. This is uh, MBS and Vladimir Putin. Shaking hands like they just, I don't know. Uh, like they just both like, like, clipped a couple of journalists. Right. They want to congratulate each other. You don't need to search to explain this. It's crazy. <laughs> like, what? We love it. Uh, now, wait. I, I want to go back and slow, slow it down a little bit. I want to go down and slow it down a little bit because... Um, you can see Trump in the background. Trump is uh, right there. Boom. Oh. oh. Oh, those guys are so cool. They'd probably be giving me the same kind of respect. Yeah, but the problem is I don't get yeah. to kill journalists in the mm. same way. It's so unfair. I'm taller than him. Oh, darn. Guys, oh. you think we can we hang out later maybe? Yeah. Can I sit? Where am I sitting? Can I sit next to them later? Oh, my God. They're so cool. That's just bizarre. It really is a little bit bizarre, isn't it? Is it? No, but isn't it? I mean, isn't that just sort of like a bizarre, like, we like unbridled <laughs> excitement at seeing each other? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I think this. They're, they're just living in look, a world where they're the just fascist like, international. They're, literally, they're is... just living in a world where they can't even, like, contemplate that what they're doing is even remotely, like. Over the top. They're just like, that's the way we roll. It's pretty crazy. People have also been sharing this about MBS sort of being just walked past in like a sort of a handshake line. Just eh, nobody really wants to shake his yeah. hand. <laughs> nobody wants that photo. We're MBS is like, it's fine. Literally Whatever. has blood on his hands. He's never looking, loved us. You know, he's looking at them and he's going, worth it. <laughs> uh, I'm not here to make friends. Yeah. Let's. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Trump is is at the G20, and um, really doesn't seem to enjoy it. Um, there's been all sorts of reports that world leaders are sort of mocking him behind his back. Apparently, he met with um, with Putin sort of casually, and yet the next day, Russian media has come out with all sorts of stories about Trump being a a, a, a goof and unclear where he is, and completely lost, and, um, you know, uh, and, and and sort of um, a clumsy oaf, which I imagine would upset him. Uh, and so uh, here is Donald Trump. And which one is this? Is this the, um, uh, this is the uh, Peña, Peña Nieto? Or, or, or well, Clipper. he's signing with Peña Nieto and Trudeau, and then the, the uh, Macri here. Too. Yeah, Macri's the uh, president of Argentina. Okay. Well, which one is... Okay, yeah, there's just the... Uh, My pick is the is the Trudeau. Yeah, that's number six. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's look at uh, this. This is... Um, uh, <laughs> they're signing the um, the renamed NAFTA with slight changes, mostly just NAFTA again. Uh, with Tro- Trudeau and uh, Peña Nieto. And Krista Freeland. And, That's super funny. Oh, Former right, Krista, MR guest, Krista Freeland. Behind yeah, Justin she's Trudeau. behind uh, Justin Trudeau. <laughs> so funny. Um, and uh, here, uh, this is one of Matt's picks because he likes how awkward things get. Trump, uh, uh, Trump, you can get a sense of what he would be like in a, in a sort of a high school exam. Pure yeah. social poise. Who's going first? Let's go. 
Let's go. We're ready. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> and then I like Trudeau here because he's the most professional. Looks up to get the uh, photo shot, and the rest of the guys don't. Well, it takes Trump like ten minutes to sign his name. I like how Pinionetto is looking at him like, "Wow, I've like I'm doing this version in a way they can't trace me." Because if you mix up your signature, they can't trace it for bank fraud. All right, now here is uh, Trump, and he's meeting uh, who's this? The, uh, the French, president of Argentina, the president of Argentina, uh, and uh, at the uh, G20, they're hosting. Uh, this uh, G20 Trump obviously feels uncomfortable because he's around other human beings, uh, particularly ones who do not um, no longer, it appears, kiss his ass. They have all basically realized, like, it doesn't matter anyways. He's, he can't deliver even when um, you're buttering him up. And so uh, here is Trump. And unfortunately for him, with a hot mic, which reveals which we all know what he was thinking. Went the wrong way. Get me out of here. He's having an anxiety attack. Get me out of here. Macri. I got I got uh, too many steps. Macri's so like, alpha. I was like, Macri's like, what's the problem? Like, I'm like, part of the new nuts. fascist axis in Latin America. Selling off my country's assets to your campaign contributors. What are you saying? And so you get a little bit of... afraid by some stairs. Yeah, dude. You're in Buenos Aires, a very nice city, home of tango. Like just walk up a step or two. It's okay. He's like a horse. If if you can't if you're a fascist and can't be comfortable in Argentina. <laughs> right. Uh folks. But if big they corp- track me down here. Big corporations are getting rich from selling your data, and Congress has completely failed to save net neutrality to protect your privacy or protect your privacy online. Now, internet providers and mobile carriers like Comcast and Verizon are free to restrict websites, spy on your online activity, or sell your browsing history to advertisers. But with one click, ExpressVPN shields your online activity from internet and mobile providers. ExpressVPN has easy-to-use apps that run seamlessly in the background of your computer, phone, and tablet ExpressVPN secures and anonymizes your internet browsing by encrypting your data and hiding your public IP address. Get ExpressVPN protection for less than seven bucks a month. ExpressVPN is rated the number one VPN service by TechRadar. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you ever use public Wi-Fi and want to keep hackers and spies from seeing your data, ExpressVPN is the solution. Folks, this is the way that, uh, well, when I'm running a, uh, a sock puppet campaign, I would use ExpressVPN, but also, um, which is, I, I, of course, don't do that. But um, it, there are sites that will not let you uh, access them because of regions, right? To watch things, buy things, et cetera, et cetera. Expre- ExpressVPN helps you out with that. Plus, it just keeps your stuff safe. Uh, and you never know. It's completely random. People break into your Wi-Fi. They get on your public network, on an airplane, wherever it is. Uh, they can get in and steal a ton of your data, not to mention the daily just uh, barrage. You don't want to be chased around the Internet because you once looked at, like, I don't know, like a, something on on Amazon, like you contemplated buying like a a sweater for somebody. And then all of a sudden all sweater ads show up everywhere. This is the way you do it. You can take back your internet privacy today. Find out how three months free. Simply go to expressvpn.com slash majority. That's express E X P R E S S V P N.com slash majority for three months free. With the one-year package, visit expressvpn.com slash majority to learn more. 
Folks, it is that time of the year. Hanukkah. Still may have time with Hanukkah. Still may have time. But at the very least, you could give a picture for Hanukkah. And then definitely you're good for Christmas right now. Gift shopping for him can seem impossible. Yes. Thankfully, Harry's makes long-lasting quality products at a super reasonable price with sets starting at just 10 bucks. I think I sent my dad um, his first Harry's Razor two, razor two years ago for Hanukkah. I can't even remember now. Uh, if he doesn't love it, returns are quick and hassle-free. Um, Harry's has been one of our longest-term sponsors now. You all heard uh, my, you know, my favorite razor is the chrome, the molded chrome uh, handle. Features of Harry's I like, the smaller blade size. And I mean, I just like the, I have to say that like the, you know, when you, when you hold a nice razor, I don't know, you feel good. It's like fine cutlery. Exactly. As a special offer for fans of this show, we partnered with Harry's to give you five bucks off any shave set, including our limited edition holiday sets, when you go to harrys.com slash majority report. Plus, you'll get free shipping. The offer is for new and returning customers. It's only available for the holidays. Generally, what they do is they just give a break on new customers, but this is for everybody. Each Harry's shaving set comes with an ergonomic weighted handle with an option to engrave. That's a nice gift. German-engineered five-blade cartridges that provide a close, comfortable shave, foaming shave gel for a rich lather, a travel cover to protect your blades, a handsome holiday gift box, or you can get something for yourself. Redeem a Harry's trial offer to experience the quality of shave before committing. Get your holiday shopping done early. Free shipping ends on December 12th, so act now. Go to harrys.com slash majority report to get five bucks off a shave set while supplies last. That's harrys.com slash majority report. All right, quick break. When we come back, uh, Marcy Wheeler. We are back, Sam Cedar on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program 
journalist, proprietor of EmptyWheel.net, author of Anatomy of Deceit, How the Bush Administration Used the Media to Sell the Iraq War and Out a Spy. Uh, Marcy Wheeler, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. Uh, All right. So a lot of activity last week. Let's start first with the collapse of the Manafort plea deal. Broadly characterize uh, it um, that that sort of collapse, I guess, and what the implications are. Well, collapse. I mean, it was built by Mueller such that if Manafort continued to act like he's been acting from the start, he would probably get some some advantages of it in any case. Um, So there are two questions. Why didn't Manafort cooperate? And where does that leave Mueller? The why didn't he cooperate? uh, Two possible answers. One is he's a compulsive liar, um, which he is. You know, like, remember that the whole way through the prosecution, both of these prosecutions, he was continuing to reach out to his um, GRU contact or his his Konstantin Kalemnik, who's been accused of having ties to GRU. And that is, according to the Wall Street Journal, one of the things he's not telling the truth about. So he continues to act like he has been acting. Um, It may also be that he is continuing to pursue a pardon that, you know, certainly Trump seems to think he's continuing to float a pardon for him. And that part of getting a pardon is staying in good with Trump and refusing to uh, tell the truth about Trump. So that may be why it collapsed. Um, But what's interesting is, um, again, Mueller seem to expect that something like this might happen. And so on Friday, he is going, Friday if not before, he is going to submit a report laying out some of the lies that that, um, Manafort told, which by definition are going to tell us both what what Manafort and possibly even Trump finds to be the most sensitive information and also um, at least some hint of what kind of proof uh, what kind of proof that um, Mueller has that he is lying. Okay. All right. So, uh, all right. So let me just um, see if I have this straight. They, they, they have a a, a deal where uh, Manafort is supposed to provide all sorts of information. It becomes clear to, um, to Mueller that Manafort is not providing that information. Um, Let's just start with the timing. Like, I mean, presumably, Right. It's no. we're not talking just Manafort tells one lie and it didn't just happen, you know, last uh, Sunday. Uh, Manafort has been telling a series of lies, right, about theoretically about ongoing behavior or, or past behavior. What does the timing of Mueller saying like, OK, now we've decided you've told enough lies. Like, I mean, what like, so I- like what what do you what do you think triggered that? Um, yeah, so um, Manafort, pl- Manafort entered this plea agreement on September 14th. So uh, basically the day before his D.C. trial was about to begin, which meant that rather than have the entire election, pre-election period focused on Trump's uh, criminal campaign manager, instead that kind of disappeared and went quiet for a while. Over the course of the next several weeks, Manafort met, depending on which news source you uh, which you follow, he met with him either nine or 12 times, um, supposedly sharing information. Right before, um, so right after the election, that's when the first status report is due. So from the beginning, the judge had said, okay, let me hear back from you in two months. The night before that was due, both sides, but it was Mueller because, you know, Mueller was the one running running the plea agreement. Both sides said, hey, we need 10 more days. And in that 10-day period, we know that the day they asked for 10 days is a day that Trump was originally going to hand in his open book test answers to Mueller and that uh, the 10-day period, in that 10-day period, Trump actually did. So Mueller gets uh, the answers to Trump's open book test and then says, oh, Manafort's been lying. And I've argued that it is possible. I mean, I don't 
uh, people have misinterpreted what I have said. I don't think that Mueller entered the plea agreement um, not believing that Manafort could plead his way, cooperate his way out of these criminal charges. I'm sure he did that in good faith, but I'm sure, you know, but it's clear that he built it so that he had protection if Manafort continued to act like Manafort had been. The the timing question, though, the short version of the timing question is, um, through that entire period, Manafort and Trump continued to compare notes. And if Trump uh, filled out his open book test, it's they're, they're called interrogatories, but I call it an open book test because that's really what it is. Um, if they compared notes through that through the time that Trump was doing his open book test and believed that they had settled on a cover story, then by waiting until he had Trump's answers, then he may have both Manafort and Trump telling the same lies. Now, Trump's lawyers did know, and Manafort's lawyers did know, before he finally turned in his open book test that that uh, Mueller had had deemed. Manafort uncooperative. Um, but nevertheless, there's, for example, um, somebody who's probably Rudy Giuliani speaking off the record, um, has already said, yeah, uh, Trump's answers matched Manafort's on questions like, did Trump know about the June 9th meeting ahead of time? And so this might be something, Sam, that we'll learn on Friday. It might be that um, Mueller will submit this report on Friday and say, um, Manafort claimed that Trump did not know about the June 9th meeting either ahead of time or even after it happened. And here are some emails that we have that show that he did and that Manafort is lying and that, oh, by the way, Trump just lied in his open book test. So that could be something that happens on Friday. OK, so did did, Ma- did Mueller know that Manafort and Trump still had this joint defense agreement during the time where Manafort was supposedly, uh, you know, planning to cooperate. And is that weird? Like, would you like, wouldn't you as a prosecutor be like, Oh, and incidentally, yeah, you can't, you, you have to end your relationship with one of the guys we may be investigating because I don't want them to know what we know. Yeah. uh, So um, again, you know, Mueller built this plea agreement, um, I, I assume very consciously the guy is not flying off the handle here. And so unlike Rick Gates's defense, unlike Rick Gates's plea agreement, which included a gag. So Rick Gates is not allowed to go blabbing about what he's telling to the prosecutor. Um, Manafort did not include that. So technically he was not prohibited from sharing that information and um, at least one lawyer argues that DOJ has a specific regulation saying you can't force somebody out of a joint defense agreement if they're entering into a plea agreement. Um, and contrary to what you might read uh, in credulous reporting in the New York Times, that was not discovered after the fact. Uh, the day that, that Manafort went into his plea agreement, Rudy Giuliani was out there saying, hey, we know about this. We're cool with it. He's not going to cooperate against Trump. There was another Politico report about midway through making it clear that that uh, that um, Kevin Downing, who is Manafort's lawyer, continued to check in with Rudy Giuliani. So unless Mueller and his all his lawyers and his press staff um, were hiding under the bed or something. Yeah, they knew about it. They knew this was ongoing. And I only assume that they were then being very careful about showing Manafort the evidence that they had collected. In other words, um, you know, it may have been, and I wrote this post about halfway through saying, you know, who's paying Kevin Downing? Who's paying Manafort's lawyers to be a mole for for Donald Trump? Um, It may have been that Mueller's prosecutors were very careful to say, are you sure that Donald Trump didn't know about that June 9th meeting? Without saying, by the way, here's your emails making it clear that he did. Right. I mean, I, and that's hypothetical. I'm not saying I know that that to be the case, but um, we know, for example, that 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 that, that the Trump people uh, avoided handing over emails involving Manafort on the June 9th meeting. So it's it's one of the things that's quite possible. Is it is it possible that Man uh, that Mueller was also giving sort of fake information to Manafort, like 
Here's our no. here's our playbook. No. Uh, we're going to no. do an end sweep no. against the Patriots. No, not like that. No, I mean it just um, you know it'd be it'd be cool to do that, but that's completely inconsistent with um, everything we know about Mueller. I mean, okay. Um, so he's not you know, saying I, I like say, he's not g- sent giving information that uh, Manafort would tell uh, or that uh, Manafort's lawyer would then tell the White House and the White House would write that in their what you call open book test. It comes back to Manaf- uh, Mueller and he's like, wow, I can really see this. Uh, I just, you know, this was like cool. barium. I just ran through the system to see where it went. Yeah, no, I mean, it might be that. Um I, I just, I, I, you know, I have been going back to, you know, 2004. I've been critical of Robert Mueller when he deserves it, but that's not the kind of thing I expect out of Robert Mueller. I, I, I think it more likely that he would do something like say, like show, you know, just show Manafort an email um, and say, so you're sure that this email doesn't end. In, indicate any knowledge of the June 9th meeting and not show, uh, you know, this is not, a, it, it is not a lie by, um, by silence. If right. they, you know, they're, they're not obliged to say, look, we've got seven pieces of evidence showing that you did meet with Trump about this meeting ahead of time. He doesn't have to show him that. Right. Um, and presumably didn't. But that, that I think falls short. And this is why, I'm trying to be really clear about this because a lot of right wingers took what I argued and said, "Oh, this is a trap." It's not a trap. It's just you know, Mueller was under no obligation to share everything he knew with Paul Manafort. And given the response to the report last week and the the hearing last week, I suspect that's what happened. That he didn't share that he had. I mean, the same thing happened, Sam, um, back in June when when Mueller caught. Manafort um, witness tampering, and he caught him back in April, right? So in, back in April, he was following as Manafort was going out to these people who were going to be witnesses in this trial and saying, you know, uh, just so you know, here's what the cover story is. I suspect it's very similar to that, that, uh, you know, Mueller uh, found the evidence, collected the evidence, backed up the evidence, and didn't share it with Manafort until such time as it was too late for Manafort to get out of it. And I suspect that we're going to see something similar on Friday if we don't see, say, charges in between now and then. Okay. And, uh, but no, like, um, oh, here, here we have, uh, you know, we, uh, yeah, okay. So no, no fake stories that uh, could get communicated back as a way of indicating that they were passing that information. Um, No, and you wouldn't even need to do that. I mean, um, I, you know, that, 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 like, say, first of all, because Manafort has been so obtuse about the many ways he's been caught in ongoing um, law breaking since he's been under indictment that I don't think it would take it, you know, and, and, and none of the people around Donald Trump are at all intelligent about this stuff. Um, but I just, I also, I, there is zero possibility that, that Mueller's team is going to, shade it all on the wrong side of bad faith when you're dealing okay. with the president. Um, Are, I don't think any prosecutor would. And uh, so I, you know, I don't think it would amount to an outright lie. Just um, remind people who uh, uh, Kilnick is. I mean, I'm not pronouncing his name right, but this is uh, Manafort's uh, uh, friend, contact, longtime business associate. What? A uh, longtime business associate. So he is a guy who, um, Rick Gates is on the record, uh, told the prosecutors that he knew was a former GRU officer. So GRU is the Russian the Russian military intelligence. They're the guys who hacked the DNC. So it just so happens that Paul Manafort, the guy who was working for free, that's in scare quotes, uh, for Donald Trump during his campaign, uh, one of his longest term business associates also happened to be a former GO, GRU officer, the same intelligence group that hacked Hillary Clinton. And they have maintained, they have um, continued to be in touch, or at least were through June, throughout the time that, that Manafort was under indictment. Um, and we know, according to the Wall Street Journal, one of the questions that Manafort uh, purportedly lied about is whether 
after being fired by Trump in August of 2016, he went on a yacht trip with Tom Barack, who's the guy who got him hired in the first place and is a huge Trump donor. And they met up with Konstantin Kalimnik there. Um, and, and there's a bunch of reasons to believe that Konstantin, Konstantin Kalimnik um, it was basically serving as a go-between between Manafort and Oleg Deripaska and a bunch of other Russian oligarchs. So, um, so the, the, the key avenue of influence between the people who hacked Hillary Clinton and the Trump campaign, or one of the key ones, would be right through that dude. And that is one of the things, according to the Wall Street Journal, that, that uh, Manafort was lying about when, if he lied, he was going to go to prison for maybe the rest of his life. Um, and so that's what he did was according to, I mean, that's at least what Mueller claims he, he lied. So on Friday, we're going to hear or <clears throat> by Friday, we're going to hear uh, at least a lot more to this story about Manafort. This is Mueller basically um, uh, saying to the judge, here's why uh, here's what he lied about. The judge makes uh, essentially a finding of fact, right? Like um, that. OK, here are the facts as you lay it out, Mueller. And uh, here is the the deposition that um, or the interview that you had with Manafort. So it is clear that he's lying. What are the implications of what Mueller is going to say and the judge making some type of finding of fact? Is that fact like what what is the durability of those findings or is it just limited to this case with Manafort? Um, it well, OK, uh. I, I talked about how in June Mueller caught Manafort witness tampering. There, it was it was a similar kind of event where he said, "Whoa, something's going on," and I'm gonna I'm gonna submit a report to you on Friday. And by the time that Friday, the Friday in June rolled around, he had indicted Manafort for those lies. And I wouldn't rule out that happening here because if he if he indicts Manafort for those lies. And possibly for, you know, the conspiracy in chief, the conspiracy with Russians in, in chief. If he indicts, uh, if he indicts Manafort for those, then the probable cause that a grand jury would find, the probable cause that he had committed those crimes would be far beyond what the judge in this case has to, has to reach. Because the way the plea agreement was set up, again, in distinction from uh, Rick Gates, where the, the standard of evidence to declare him uh, breaking the plea agreement there was preponderance of evidence. In in um, Manafort's case, it's just good faith. So it's a really low bar that uh, Mueller has to reach in this report on Friday to be able to claim that um, that Manafort was lying. But I don't rule out the possibility, because he's done it in the past, that rather than give Amy Berman Jackson, the judge in this case, the headache of having to, you know, say, okay, you lied and you're going to prison for the rest of your life. They can just, you know, indict it. And then she doesn't have to make that decision. If, mm-hmm. You know, the, any, any judgment on her case is, is done. And there are reasons they might want to do that. Um, so I, I leave that as a possibility. Okay. If, I'm sorry. Just, not, just to be clear. The, so the indictment could be submitted to the judge and then the judge says, okay, fair enough. Uh, he, he, the indictment, indicates that he um, he uh, breached his agreement. So the, right. it would still have to go through a court order, right? There would still have to be some uh, process beyond the indictment, but the indictment would take care of all the sort of like um, uh, decision-making process or, I, sh- I guess, assessment process. Right, right, okay. right. Um, but in any case, I mean, the standard here is really low. If, if they don't do that, then they'll submit a report um, Manafort's lawyers will stall in hopes, I guess, that that um, that uh, the president will pardon him in the interim period, or some, you know, maybe that Mueller will get fired in the interim. Who knows? Um, and then they'll respond, and eventually, and again, because the standard is really low here, and I I can't imagine that that the Mueller crowd doesn't have their ducks in order. Um, eventually, Jackson, Amy Berman Jackson, would would rule for Mueller. And then what happens then is, I mean, first of all, the stuff that's already in place, it continues. So um, they made a plea agreement and the plea agreement allowed them to seize $46 million of Paul Manafort's ill-gotten goods. And that's all been processing while this has gone on. So, and, and there's only a challenge to 13 million of that. So, 
So already what has happened since Manafort made that plea agreement and failed to abide by it um, is that something uh, in the order of $33 million of his property is either already has been or is well down the road of being taken away and put in the U.S. Treasury. And, oh, by the way, that pretty much pays for the entire Mueller investigation by itself. Um, Does Manafort have more money? Huh? Does he have more well, money? Well, that's the other question. You know, um, no, he shouldn't. It took him. It took him six months to to figure to find enough liquid and legal assets to be able to get bail. Um, so he can't have that much more in the United States in legal form. But there's, you know, he is the, this notion that he's going to get a plea agreement and that's better. I mean, he's going to get a pardon and that's better than whatever he's got in front of him. Strongly suggests. I mean, that only makes sense if he's got another option. And, you know, the other option, maybe that, I've been, you know, hypothetical. Again, one of the things that Manafort allegedly lied about to prosecutors is um, payments from lobbying in Ukraine. So my guess is one of the things that we're going to learn on Friday, if not before, is that he's been hiding, say, another $100 million of ill-gotten goods in Cyprus or something like Mm. that. And Mueller is going to say, here's all the money that you've been hiding and still is, you know, that you're not. Let me charge you with another hundred million dollars of tax evasion charges. How about that Um, as a way to kind of re-up the pressure on on Manafort? I mean, that's one thing that could happen in the next week or the next little while. Um, But my guess is, yeah, my guess is that he um, continues to hide wealth outside of the country um, and therefore, uh, by lying about it, uh, that also means he's evaded taxes and then could be charged again for those. So what do you think has been the game here with Manafort? I mean, broadly speaking, like he just he thought he could get away with this. Or do you think I mean, I've heard the theory that. Uh, the idea is like he didn't have to pay for a lawyer or I should say a lawyer litigating these cases. Uh, he took the plea deal. It falls apart, but it's basically a punt. And the further down the road he can get without expending money, he just waits for, for Trump's pardon. Or is it just a just an enormous amount of 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 hubris that I suppose is, you know, not particularly unwarranted? These guys got away with this stuff for decades it feels like and you know never anticipated that they'd be scrutinized in this way but uh, which what is it do you think both but i mean there's no way you continue the dpa the the um the jpa the joint the the dp the the the, the joint defense agreement the jda um without expecting a pardon right i mean what you're doing through that whole process is again i've used this term serving as a mole inside the Mueller investigation, reporting back to Trump. And that may have been useful for Mueller in that lead up to the, to the election to kind of get, you know, kind of placate Trump and get him to turn back in his open book test and, and start moving forward on the resolution of this whole thing. But, you know, the, the thing is that, um, you know, 90% of the lawyers you see on cable are talking about normal legal proceedings, probably 95%, probably 99%. And normal legal proceedings involve defense defendants who um, maybe down the road might imagine getting some kind of clemency. But Paul Manafort is a guy who every action he's taken seems to be premised on his best option being getting a presidential pardon. Right. Um, I, there are still questions about that. I mean, he is liable to be charged in Virginia and New York. For tax evasion, because if you've evaded taxes at federal level, you've done so at the state level as well. And Trump can't pardon those. And those jails, those prisons, uh, state prisons are far less uh, accommodating to a guy with the lifestyle of Paul Manafort. Right. And, you know, it may be that he avoids uh, a Virginia. It may be that he does. He spends the rest of his life in club fed. Or in a Virginian state prison, if I were in Paul Manafort, I would choose the former. But but again, you know, there are no there but are. But doesn't no he good. know that? I mean, doesn't he, doesn't he look at this and say? Doesn't his attorney say like, look, um, 
there are all sorts of state charges that they can bring that uh, theoretically Donald Trump can't touch. You know, um, Tish James in in New York is not going to be is it not going to you know, she's going to build her career on the opportunity to prosecute you or, you know, I would imagine the same with all these state AGs like this is. This is not something they're going to shy well, not away. Florida, Florida well, is not Florida, Florida, not Florida, not <laughs> Florida. But, 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 uh, but yes, yes. Tish James could build her career by making sure that Manafort does the rest of his life in prison. And therefore, it is unreasonable to assume that a pardon is going to fix all of Manafort's ills. But nevertheless, you you know, there's there's no good legal background for these people. And, and, and most of these people... I mean, it was funny, and when Michael Cohen submitted his sentencing memorandum last week, so many people who have been following this case just let out this collective sigh of relief because finally we're seeing competent lawyering. But, like, all of these people, Trump especially, but including, I mean, Manafort doesn't have the best lawyers in the world, and, and he's a terrible client. I mean, I wouldn't want to work for him, uh, which is why people don't want to work for him or for Trump. And so, you know, it's... Uh, it could be that if a really competent defense attorney were advising Manafort, they would have cooperated already as we right. did, it, right? Um, but it, but it's this is the crazy thing about the story is that you can't make reliable analysis when the pardon is on the table and has been from the start, and when the lawyers really aren't up to the job. On you know, on, not it's not universally true, but it's. It's true of a lot of these defendants. It's it's a little bit like trying to predict monkeys playing chess on some level. They're just not necessarily right. making rational decisions because they don't. They're have... not going to make the moves that every every skilled chess player knows because they're monkeys playing chess. That's uh, a good analogy. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Um, so so uh, Cohen is he what uh, that later in the week Cohen goes in and says. Um, yeah, I also I lied to Congress. What are the implications of 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 Cohen lying to Congress? The implications of Cohen lying to Congress are that um, Mueller used it as an opportunity to write up nine pages, making it clear that the Trump Tower deal that um, that Cohen allegedly stopped pursuing in January of 2016 actually went through at least June of 2016, and, and according to BuzzFeed's reporting, went through at least July of 2016, and according to other reporting, went through the inauguration. So in other words, um, from a legal standpoint, it's nothing. I mean, from a legal standpoint, charged with what Cohen was already charged with in New York, uh, being charged with an additional account of lying really isn't going to add to his prison time. It's just not. Uh, but what it did is it means he's going to have two prosecutors who sometime this week will say, you know what, he's been pretty helpful going after these uh, criminal organizations that all, all by the way, name, are named Trump. He's been pretty helpful for us. Um, and so you're going to have Mueller say that as well as the, the Manhattan prosecutors who helped, who, who charged him for helping Trump hide the Stormy Daniels story during the campaign uh, with the involvement of Trump organization. Right. Um, but, but, it, you know, as I said, like people keep talking about this, this kind of fantastic report that Mueller has been writing all this time. And I keep saying, look, the report is right there out there in the open. And this is another example of it. Mueller has just laid out evidence that, um, that Trump uh, was considering uh, working with a, GRU, this is the same military, Russian military intelligence again, a GRU tied bank to build the biggest hotel in Moscow at, in the same period when his son, who, by the way, is an executive of Trump organization and was in the loop on these negotiations, took a meeting saying uh, this is part of the package that Russia is offering your dad as part of election year assistance. And so that dramatically changes the connotation of that email that, that Rob Goldstone sent to Don Jr. Because uh, given that Don Jr. knew that there was something to be gained in the form of a, you know, of a big new 
licensing agreement in Moscow that they had been chasing for a decade, right? Mm-hmm. Um, given that Don Jr. knew that that was on the table, him accepting that meeting, that June 9th meeting, is dramatically different. Um, even before you get into the fact that Mueller included in that in in that story that he told about Cohen, that um, that after the June 9th meeting or the day of the June 9th meeting, Cohen Cohen basically made plane reservations to go to St. Petersburg as if he was acting on having reached an agreement. And then on June 14th, he canceled his plane reservations as if responding to the public news that the, the disclosure that, um, that the DNC knew that they had been hacked by the GRU. So, um, so that's a dramatic part of the story that, that Mueller used Cohen's cooperation to tell. And he's still got Cohen on, on, I mean, one of the things he's, he didn't do, he's not doing is he's not yet saying your cooperation has been substantial enough. We think that you should get no time, even though Cohen is asking for it, uh, that, that we think you should get no time for your, um, for all your other crimes. Uh, Cohen's going to have to keep going back to Mueller's office and telling him more of the story. And, and presumably there's a lot more, right? I mean, like maybe not even like Cohen's been his lawyer for over a dozen years and I got to think that it's not just I did uh, illegal payments for one uh, one particular, um, you know, uh, adult actress and also just lied about one real estate deal. Like presumably Cohen did a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So Cohen was involved in the loop of um, some other dodgy deals with people in the neighborhood of the former Soviet Union. There's a Kazakh group that in particular uh, people had pointed to his involvement in. So he, he's been involved in these corrupt negotiations in the past. So that presumably is one of the things he's been talking about. He, in 2011, is the guy who set up the, um, the dark money group that basically funneled Trump organization money into a presidential investigative committee for Trump. Uh, that was illegal, but Don McGahn, when he was an FEC commissioner, kind of said, oh, we're not going to prosecute that. So, But Cohen was involved in that, which was the moment, by the way, that, that the world knew that Donald Trump wanted to become president. And included in that world are the Russians, right? So, um, so he was involved there. And he was also involved in the 2013 um, meetings to set up the Miss Universe contest in Moscow. And... Um, Aras Agalara, the guy who set up the June 9th meeting, his people in the aftermath of that becoming clear were sort of like, whoa, Michael Cohen knows us. Um, and so there's a backstory there that I'm sure he's explained to Mueller as well. Um, and then Cohen was also, you know what, we, people don't talk enough about this, man, but Cohen and Elliot Brody, who is about to get a whole in a whole heap of legal trouble with um, this money laundering thing tied to Malaysia. All right. And just to be clear, uh, Elliot Brody is the other uh, Republican, big Republican donor who supposedly was Cohen's only other client besides Sean Hannity, uh, who uh, Brody had Cohen supposedly pay off another uh, uh, would be mistress, right? On his behalf, the- supposedly. Right. Uh, okay. On his behalf, but there's a lot of reason to believe it might have been uh, uh, Trump. But right. they were co fundraising chairs for the RNC and remain such. I mean, Cohen remained such for a really long time and he was kind of self-dealing as part of that. So Cohen is there through the self-dealing of the RNC. Cohen is there uh, through the inauguration and he's self-dealing off of that as well. So, you know, the inauguration is a giant pay to play. And one of the things another plea agreement makes clear is that um, this Constantin Kalimnik guy, was buying tickets from the inauguration through straw donors. So this is an this is an instance after Trump has gotten elected, where uh, suspected GRU, the guys who hacked Hillary Clinton, is hiding the fact that he's dumping money into Trump's pocket after he's won the election. So we got before, middle, and after with this relationship with the GRU, and Cohen is aware of all of that. And theoretically, he's wet in his beak. I felt like I had to say that in the context of this. <laughs> right. I mean, he's, you know, there's a lot he's got to chat with. And 
I mean, and this explains, I mean, one of the things that's really important to remember. So when he was raided back uh, in April, um, Trump flipped out. Trump really flipped out. And that's when he said, I'm not going to cooperate with Mueller anymore. This is beyond the pale. You're going into my business dealings. What he knew when he set that red line about Mueller investigating his business dealings from the start is that he was going to find stuff like this, including the Trump Tower deal. Um, But what happened in April is that he got to see what the Manhattan prosecutors had seized from Cohen. So unlike Manafort, like he doesn't know what prosecutors got from Manafort's condo back in July of 2017, but he does know what prosecutors got from Cohen's condo in April of 2018. And so at first he was like, oh my gosh, you're going after my personal lawyer. This is the worst thing. This is the worst thing. And about two weeks into that process, he was like, he's dead to me. And that he's dead to me line probably came around the time where he discovered that Cohen had been recording him in these conversations. Right. And that probably is when their relationship started. Like he was going to buy off Cohen up until that point. He was going to pardon Cohen and it was all going to blow over. And because Trump cares more about loyalty than sanity, as soon as he realized that Cohen had protected himself, then I think Trump cut him off, and that's why we've got the plea deal with Cohen, and um, and things are beginning to spin out of control for Trump because he he you know he's the the thing is he's not a competent corrupt man. Right. He's gotten away with it up until now, but um, he like I I said this really early on, pardoning or not pardoning he he didn't get a pardon until Trump came along. Commuting Scooter Libby's sentence is how George Bush and Dick Cheney managed to minimize the damage of outing Valerie Plame. And it really, I mean, it, and it, it was a very delicate uh, implementation of um, preventing him from flipping on Dick Cheney. Um, and, and, uh, and as it became clear that Trump was trying to do this, I said, you know, I just don't think there's anybody in his universe that is competent enough to pull off what George Bush and Dick Cheney pulled up. Ain't going to happen. And everything we've seen thus far says that that's true We'll see whether he he can manage to keep Manafort quiet, but it it may be too late. I mean, it may be that Mueller doesn't need Manafort, um, might like him, you know, might like him for the counterintelligence investigation to know more about the Russian intelligence uh, collection on Americans. But um, but certainly it didn't work with Cohen. Okay, let's talk about Jerome Corsi. Uh, Jer- <laughs> Jerome Corsi seems to be sort of a, a late entry, right? I mean, we have. A, the, I feel like his name just sort of came out of nowhere, like two or three weeks ago. Um, wh- well, that's not actually true. Um, way back when Mueller's, when the FBI stopped this guy named Ted Mallet, who's um, who has worked with Corsi uh, as he was flying into the country into Logan Airport back in March. Uh, one of the first things Malik did was call Corsi. And he made it clear to Corsi that the FBI was asking him about Corsi. So but if you were paying really close attention, you would have known in March that Corsi was going to be in, in, in Mueller's scope. It just took a long time for him to get there. You know, he went and interviewed every other Roger Stone potential source for ties to WikiLeaks. And then in late August served Corsi with a subpoena and, um, and of course, there was a lot of back and forth. Corsi says that he and, and Stone um, created a cover story back in August 2016, right? I, like, I'm going to write a post today or tomorrow laying out how they've got, like, a, um, Russian dolls set of cover stories that they are protecting together, Corsi and Stone. But that, that those, those Russian dolls of cover stories, They start in August 2016, well before there's any investigation into this. Stone did something, and and after he did that whatever, he went to Corsi and said, Corsi, you need to help me build a cover story, only they didn't do it very competently. And one of the things Corsi did before his relationship with Mueller uh, blew up is um, under immunity testify to the grand jury that, um, that he and he and Stone have been working on cover stories since August of 2016 about this source of information that they knew. Um, and I've, I've laid out why I believe even the public record uh, shows that they not only knew that Podesta's emails were going to come out, but they knew that the content of Podesta's emails 
were going to support an attack they were already making against Podesta in August 20, 2016. So that's where we're going to go. Um, I don't know when we get there, but that's where we're going to go. Um, the story that came out last week in The Guardian, it's been sort of uh, even The Guardian itself has sort of rewritten it is to be um, a lot more conditioned and qualified, I guess. But the story was that Manafort th- supposedly visited Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy starting, I think, in 2013 um, and as late as um, uh, March of 20. Was it March uh, or August of uh, of 2016? 2016. <clears throat> and so what um, what do you make of that story? And is that I mean, what's your assessment of that story and what would be the implications if it's if 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 it's true? I'm one of the like 20 people right, left and center, uh, pro, anti and neutral on Assange who doesn't think that story holds up. Um, there is a part of the story that is documented, and that is sometime in May or June or July of 2017, uh, Manafort was in Ecuador, uh, allegedly setting up a Chinese business deal, but there's reason to believe that he may have been trying to intervene on behalf of Assange. So that's that's been out there for a long time, and that is confirmed. What seems to have happened is there's this whole other uh, allegation that Manafort was you know, bopping in to, for visits with Julian Assange, and um, there might be a nugget of truth to that. I mean, one of the things that is important for people to know is that this guy named Adam Waldman, who was kind of a, a uh, he's a lawyer, but he was mostly just doing lobbying for Oleg Deripaska, who is one of the oligarchs who owns Paul Manafort. He also was doing some work for Julian Assange in 2017, trying to get him up, basically trying to get him apart. And so... Oleg Deripaska, so Oleg Deripaska has ties to both Assange and Manafort in interesting ways, in ways that may have to do with the Steele dossier as well. Um, Christopher Steele did some work for Deripaska as well. Uh, did, you know, Deripaska was a source for him. So, um, so that universe of people all kind of comes together. So it's not unreasonable to suggest that there might be ties through that network. But the notion that Paul Manafort was able to waltz into the Ecuadorian embassy and visit Julian Assange without getting picked up either by the visitor logs, which have already been released, or by um, some no longer friendly to Julian Assange staffers who would have leaked it long ago, you know, is hard to believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, is, is there's just so much, so many kinds of surveillance going on on the embassy and Manafort's uh, operational security stinks. So the, the, the notion that he'd be able to kind of uh, clandestinely sneak into the embassy and go visit with Julian Assange, I, I don't find that believable. There was also a line in that Guardian story that talked about what Manafort was wearing on one day, which I thought was very odd. I know. Uh, well, it, the, the implication being that we have a, a video of him, right? I mean, that's what that is saying. But who would have that video and who would have leaked that information? Was that is that more just sort of like an Ecuadorian, um, you know, Manafort being used in the context of an Ecuadorian fight? Uh, or was there was that supposed to be some type of, of rat F or a, you know, to sort of say like, oh, look at how crazy people are getting with all these crazy ideas about Manafort. Or was it supposed to be some type of metaphor? I think I think um, it's possible it's disinformation. It's possible a, a number of people who are real close to the Assange story note that um, part of the story goes back to Ecuadorian intelligence and um and the kind of mainstream Ecuadorian intelligence hates Assange. They've got reason to want to burn Assange. So it could be that. But there is a big battle within Ecuador right now um, about whether or not Assange is going to be booted from the embassy. And it, it also wouldn't surprise me if some of the people thinking that, that Ecuador needs to continue to respect the asylum claim of Julian Assange um, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they released that that as disinformation to um, undermine, you know, the case that 
Assange should be booted and extradited to the United States. The funny thing about the claim about what he was wearing is that, you know, this is a guy who wears ostrich skin jackets, right? right. He is not a sloppy dresser. And they described him as walking in in chinos. And it's like, that's not Paul Manafort, you know? It's not Paul Manafort because he would not be caught dead in London not wearing a full suit. Not going to happen. Um, just on the sort of the metaphorical standpoint, do you, what, what do you, I mean, I'm asking you to speculate here, but what do you think the chances are that, um, that Assange was in direct contact with someone like Manafort in some fashion or... I mean, I guess Stone and Corsi, maybe we already know they are, but what's your, what's your sense well, of it? Well, Stone and Corsi are indirectly in touch with Assange. There's still something about the Mueller story that uh, is going to be a big reveal. Uh, I don't know what it is, but because um, it's because it's simply not against the law to uh, speak to Guccifer 2.0. Tons right. of people did it, right? Uh, or to Assange. Tons of people did that, too. Uh, he's not yet, you know, Mueller is not yet indicting Hannity and Hannity um, and, and Hannity went at a very interesting time, by the way, to the embassy to go meet with uh, Assange. And, and I don't doubt that he served as a cutout uh, between Trump and Assange when he did that. Um, but thus far, we haven't heard that Hannity is being investigated for doing that. So there has to be something more. Um and I suspect when we learn what it is, it's going to be a big reveal. But um, but uh, but we don't know what it is. We don't. And so it's it's going to be more than just that. Jerome Corsi worked through go betweens to figure out when. Uh, and and as I said, Sam, I think the public record solidly backs the notion that they not only knew that Desta's emails were coming, they knew specifically what some of the content was because it's clear they anticipated it and it's clear that on October 6, 2016, Jerome Corsi knew that it was coming. And so uh, so they had to have known ahead of time. The question is how and whether that amounts to a crime. Okay, so uh, going forward, what we sh- what should we be looking for? I mean, obviously, in the next couple of days, uh, Mueller's going to file something um, that will or maybe roll out another indictment of Manafort, but either way, it will be some mechanism in which to uh, present to the court that Manafort has lied, he's, he's, he's broken his plea agreement, and now we're going to send him to jail for a long, long time. What's, the ne- what, what's, what's next, do you think? Um, one thing we know is next is the sentencing submissions for Mike Flynn are going to be submitted. And what are the implications of that? I mean, so Flynn knows he's going to prison. He finds out how long he's going to prison. And what what? Well, he may avoid prison. He may avoid prison. How would he do that? He may avoid prison. Um, Well, because he was only charged with false statements. So uh, he would have the same range as Papadopoulos to begin with. Um, And unlike Papadopoulos, we have every reason to believe he did cooperate and provide valuable information. So uh, I would expect that uh, unless there's going to be another surprise like there was with Papadopoulos and Manafort where we learned he wasn't cooperating, I would suspect that what we're going to learn is we're going to get a submission from Mueller's team that says, um, you know, in traditional fashion it would say he provided substantial cooperation. We think that he should uh, just do probation. Um, and and that's, that, may be the, that, may be what, that may be the default to expect. But Mueller has never not used these opportunities to tell a story. So I, I would expect at a minimum, we're going to we're going to get a story that says, you know, Flynn explained how in the transition period Donald Trump worked with the Russians to um, to pr- promise the Russians that he was going to overturn sanctions, um, and. Uh, and Flynn told us that that was part of a payoff for a deal. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we might get next week in conjunction with, with the Flynn sentencing memo. So Mueller is basically like uh, releasing uh, chapters of his book, is, essentially, not necessarily in serial form, but, uh, you know, here's chapter three, here's chapter 27, here's chapter 17, basically just leaving it at different courthouses. Right. And, and, and that's what, I mean, you know, there has been so much conversation about 
this report that Mueller is eventually going to release, most of that came from Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani has fooled himself into believing that this thing ends with a re- when a report comes out and Mueller says, well, I wanted to charge Don Jr., but I really couldn't get enough evidence. Um, and, and I, you know, I imagine that Mueller allowed him to believe that it is in fact the case that Mueller is required to submit a report. Um, right now it'll go to Matt Whitaker, the kind of, um, uh, hatchet job AG that, that, that Trump installed. But everything we've seen over the course of this from the very first plea agreement with George Papadopoulos has made it clear that Mueller wants to tell his stories in these charging documents. And unless he's fired tomorrow, I would expect that to continue. Interesting. Um, And lastly, uh, Marcy, do you think that the idea of building that Trump Tower in Russia is is enough? Does that provide some type of like motive? I mean, is that, you know, is that the do you think that's the operative theory that the that um, to the extent that Trump, um, you know, was was looking for that was part of the quid pro quo, I guess? It was part of it. I don't think I'm, I'm sure it was not all of it. Um, and when you get to the Seychelles meeting uh, in January of 2017, there were other things on offer. Uh, so it wasn't just the Trump Tower. Everyone around Trump was going to get rich by having sold out the country. Um, and, you know, the, 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 where, the place where the plan started falling apart and the only place where the plan started falling apart was in Donald Trump actually getting elected. Right. So. Donald Trump probably assumed he signed up in May of 2016 for, yes, I'm happy to accept a Trump Tower deal in Moscow, one I've been chasing for 10 years, uh, with the understanding that I'm going to beat up relentlessly on Hillary Clinton, which I was going to do anyway, but I'm going to focus on the emails. I'm going to make the emails that you are releasing into something much bigger than they are. I'm going to make them a cornerstone of my campaign, which of course he did, right? Um, And... That was, I think, what Donald Trump signed up for in May of 2016, in June of 2016, when they took that Trump Tower meeting, the, the, the June 9th meeting, right? Um, and he was happy to make promises that he would get rid of sanctions. He was happy to make promises that he he'd work with Russia and Syria and Ukraine because he didn't think he was going to win. Right. So on some And then level- he won, and that's when things started going haywire, because having won, all of a sudden there was a lot more scrutiny on this. And he thought, it, you know, he thought in the first two months as president that he would be in a position to kill the investigation into how he got elected. And thus far, it hasn't worked out that way. So, so if I understand you correctly, it's possible that Trump thought the Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, um, oppo research that he was getting was not necessarily a get for him. That was a give. That like, yeah, so, you so. give me you give me that material and I'm going to broadcast it for you. In return, we're all going to make a ton of money. And I would imagine, too, that when we talk about the Seychelles, uh, that meeting was not just about Russia. It was also about um, uh, the Saudis, right, and the UAE. Um, that, and the Israelis. And the Never Israelis. The Israelis. <laughs> so, so, I mean, we're really looking at you know, just a, uh, you know, sort of a, um, uh, a, a, some type of network deal where it's just like, yeah, no, I'll broadcast this material for you. He didn't think it was going to help him win necessarily. He thought he was doing them a favor by get, by weakening the next president for their, uh, for them. Well, I think he was willing to do it because that's what he's always done. I mean, you know, that's, that's what he's done. He's been a troll. Uh, and guess what? A troll just won the presidency. But what's interesting, one of the, you know, I, I talk a lot about Mueller's speaking indictments. When, when Manafort accepted a plea deal, Mueller released 40 pages of evidence. And the evidence all had to do with how, um, how Manafort worked with Yanukovych, uh, the Ukrainian president, right? And part of that was the campaign against Timoshenko, against his opponent. And the things he did again to beat Timoshenko and to and to kill to kill Timoshenko's career afterwards, uh, all parallel what Manafort was doing for Hillary Clinton, uh, doing against Hillary Clinton, down to accusing her of crime. Like the lock her up chant goes back to Ukraine when Manafort was working for Yanukovych. And so I suspect when the full story is told, Mueller wants to show that. Uh, uh, 
the 2016 election is just a repeat for Manafort of stuff he did before. And so to the extent that Trump uh, hired and bought into the way that Manafort was going to run the campaign, uh, he bought into running a campaign the same way that a Ukrainian Russian backed oligarch would, which is what he is. He's a Russian backed oligarch, right? So that's the story that we're eventually going to get. And so I think it was, you know, like the biggest problem with the story, like, I think you're right. Did did he think he was doing Russia a favor or did he think it was a gift from Russia? I think it's both. Um, And I think that, I think Mueller certainly is moving towards a conspiracy case where the terms of this deal are laid out. Uh, But, but it's not a traditional quid pro quo because they're both in bed together. I mean, everyone's benefiting if you uh, debase American democracy by running a presidential campaign like Trump did. Trump was willing to do it, but that's who Trump is. The Russians, that was a win-win-win for the Russians until uh, Trump be- proved unable to, to ditch the, uh, the legal investigation. Huh. Marcy Wheeler, always a pleasure. The blog is EmptyWheel.net. Thank you so much for your time today. Fascinating stuff. Thanks, Sam. Take care. Bye-bye. There you go. Win, 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 win. It's all coming home now. Uh, That's fascinating. It never really uh, occurred to me to look at it that way, that it was like, um, yeah, I get something to talk about. This is win-win. I got, uh, you want me to weaken Hillary Clinton? And I had nothing to talk about during the election anyway. So it's now I got the email. pro everybody, except for Hillary. It's just like that time where those girls who love to pee on guys came over to, it was came over like to the, the hotel like, room. And I was like, yeah, you can pee on me. You can do that. You love to do who? it, and I want it. It's also like the guy who called Hillary a dog. Who? It was just a great line. And who's working for who here? It doesn't matter. We're all getting paid. This is all voluntary anyway. Yeah, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. There, there you go. Thing called free association. All right, folks. Speaking of which, it is your support that makes the show possible. <laughs> who's getting paid here? I don't know. <laughs> this is a win-win-win for all of us. As long as, we, as, long as the cops don't find out, we're all going to be good. Uh, you can become a member at uh, jointhemajorityreport.com. Jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, when you become a member for just a couple of bucks a week, you support the free show every day. And then we say thank you by giving you the fun half, ladies and gentlemen. Also, uh, what your uh, membership dollars do, they support um, the upgrading of equipment, working on a system to get higher quality uh, audio interviews. We're working on uh, a system where occasionally we'll be able to do video interviews as well. Nice. Pajama boys over. And uh, now have uh, at least three shows uh, that uh, regularly uh, work out of this office. Um, so the the higher production value cuts across all multiple products and probably more in the future. And then, of course, it raises the game for everybody in the entire industry. Competition. Uh, Competition competition spreads, kicks in. um, You know, I I ran into a a listener at at a a Brazil event, and he came up and introduced himself to me, and and he said, you guys are like the Wu-Tang Clan. Left wing podcast. There you go. That's how I think of that's myself. A, that's perfect. That's a, Matt certainly <laughs> thinks of himself that way. Um, so uh, go to uh, jointhemajorityreport.com, become a, a member today. Also, justcoffee.coop, th- like in the next two weeks, uh, 30% off. You don't need a coupon code or anything. Just head over there, 30% off, justcoffee.coop. This is a great time for you to try all sorts of uh, just coffee. Uh, see if you like the MR blend. See if you like the, uh, um, I can't remember the name. What's that one with the women from uh, from the uh, Guatemalan collective? Los, Los, Los Diosas uh, blend is one of my favorites. Uh, Bike Fuel, another one, one of my favorites. Doesn't matter. Majority Report is really the one you should get. And uh, also, 
we're selling out our January 13th live show. Brendan told me yesterday was the first day that we sold under 10 tickets a day. So at this pace, I can't do the math, but you don't have much. Lo- uh, we're not going to probably have tickets by the end of December at this pace. So Jesus, by mid-December at this pace. It's going to be like jingle all the way. People trying to get the last ticket. I'm not familiar the, with the that. The Arnold Schwarzenegger it. movie? I didn't, I didn't oh. see it. Oh, okay. That was after Oh, time. I did see that movie. That's a great point. There's going to be MR people fist Who don't fighting get each tickets. other in then... front of the bell house for the last tickets. I Yay. love it. Uh, so uh, head to uh, majority.fm there. You can see a link to our tickets, a link to uh, uh, Michael's live show in February. Um, and uh, speaking of Michael's show in February, tomorrow is not February. So tomorrow, I, I want to uh, tomorrow, of course, uh, TMBS will be live at 7 p.m. NYC time. Uh, on the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel, of course, patreon.com slash TMBS, and on iTunes on Sunday, the Patreon content was on The Daily Show Generation and Logic for the Left, which is a really interesting uh, case for the left to actually embrace logic and facts and win with them. Of course, I'm pretty allergic to that kind of argument, but it was fascinating. Patreon.com slash TMBS. And um, Jamie? Yeah, so this week on the Antifada, Sean and I do a recap of our trip to Mexico and all the things we got up to there, including our visit to the Casa de Leon Trotsky, as well as the Autonomous Zapatista community of Oventique, where we got to see uh, actually existing libertarian socialism. Very, very cool. We got to speak with the junta there. It was a really amazing experience for us so we give a little background on the zapatista uprising and the continuing struggle in chiapas um we also tell a little love story about how our good friend who was traveling with us met a girl on tinder in san cristobal who ended up coming on our psychedelic journey to isla holbush with us wow um i didn't realize you could do that internationally that stuff mm, he you can't can. do tinder mm-hmm. internationally i, I didn't didn't even occur to me yeah. Nap, the dude. language of love is universal. I Express VPN. Sense. You can t- uh, the, yeah. you can match. <laughs> <laughs> is that true? Bumble Express VPN? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my podcast is called Literary Hangover. I would enjoy if you would uh, download some of those episodes and listen to them. Sweet. Did you know? Well, we'll talk about that in the fun half. About the that Red Dead. I didn't realize that thing was came out ten ten years ago. The first version. The first one. Yeah. yeah I had no idea. Yeah, it's crazy. It's pretty fun. All right, folks, 646-257-3920 is the number. See you in the fun half.